And what do we see? We see that the people obeyed in verse 7. Now, some of you may react and say, I am so disgusted by this. How could all of those people do such a thing? And you may even be comparing it to things that we've seen in our society in the last few years. Some of you may be disgusted that people followed some ordinances or recommendations from the government. You may compare it to this. You may have other things floating in your head of how, how could somebody do that and worship this king? He's disgusting. But I think if we took an honest evaluation, it would lead us to this conclusion. Very few, if any of us, have faced anything compared to what we just read. Where the most powerful ruler in the world looked right at you in your eyes and said, if you don't literally worship in front of me, I will murder you. How would you react? How have I reacted in other things that Satan has put in my way to tempt me? Have I had the power to stand firm in my faith, or have I buckled? We've all buckled. So what we see from here is not a disgusting group of people that we can sit from a higher position and say, how dare they? It's a group of people that we can say need a Savior just like we need a Savior. That's what we see in verse 7. But we move into verses 8 through 12, and what else we see is more pride, more sin nature fleshing itself out from the people because we see the peers, the other leaders of that area who are peers to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they demand judgment. And what we see in their response to the king or their conversation with the king is that they have a sin that is disguised as loyalty. Remember, they come to the king and they say these things. They say, well, Scripture tells us they maliciously accused the Jews. They called them the Jews. They also, in verse 12, says, when they, when they tell the king, there are certain Jews who you have appointed who are doing something wrong. So what we see here is we have many things at play. We have jealousy because outsiders, foreigners who were originally taken captive and going to be killed, are now in prominent positions. And I don't think the homeboys like that too much, right? They want to see themselves higher up. They don't want to see foreigners higher up. So there's jealousy. They also had prejudice against the Jews. And that comes out as we see in the reading. But they're disguising their sin as loyalty to the king. Hey, king, we love you so much. We want to make sure that you're aware that there are some people who aren't being loyal. And they disguise it as like this whole friendly idea, but really they're self-serving. They want themselves to be recognized, just like the king wants himself to be recognized. And in our own life, sin has so many disguises. We're fooled a lot at the sin in our own lives. One of our elders always prays, Lord, please reveal to us the sin that we have in our own lives, because sometimes we are so blind to it. It has many disguises, and Satan likes that. He deceives us. He lies. We see that in the life of these people who disguise their sin as loyalty to the king, but that loyalty was self-serving. Notice how they address the king. They come up to him and they say, O king, live forever. You think that hit Nebuchadnezzar in a real nice spot? Don't you think he loved to hear that? Here he is saying, this head of gold in this statue of my dream, that's not good enough. There won't be anyone greater than me ever, so I'm going to have this whole entire statue built that's all gold. See, I will live forever. My kingdom is forever. And then he has his, his lackeys come up to him and say, live forever. He's standing there even prouder than he was before. They recognize it. But they said it because they played into his pride so that they felt good about themselves and sin was self-serving. So they make that report to the king and Nebuchadnezzar responds in verses 13 to 15 by feeling insulted. Why does he feel insulted? Because there are three people out of however many people there are, hundreds, thousands, millions, I don't know how many people there are, but it's a huge crowd of people, and he's insulted because all of them but three bowed down to worship. So he feels insulted because his pride says that everybody must worship. 
I can't have anyone not looking to me. He embraces sin. And when we embrace sin, it leads to more sin. Notice verse 13. It says what? Nebuchadnezzar was filled with furious rage. Nebuchadnezzar had a problem. In chapter 4, we're going to see that he lives in the wilderness like a beast. Some people say that he was crazy. Some people say that he had a mental disorder. But at minimum, here's what we know. We see that sin is abounding, and he is rejecting God working on his heart. We, have, we saw a softening of his heart last week, but how quickly he has changed, and it's become about himself, and now he's in a furious rage. One moment... He praised God, and the next he rejects God. He's a roller coaster. And the reason he's a roller coaster is because he isn't dwelling in the presence of God Almighty. He keeps getting in his own way. He can't decide if God is supreme or if Nebuchadnezzar is supreme. And so we see furious rage. This is why for us, the Holy Spirit, God's word, daily walking with Jesus Christ is so important. It has to be constant because we like to react. We like to be emotional, just like Nebuchadnezzar. So are we constantly growing towards Christ or are we a roller coaster up and down hoping that today goes good? Nebuchadnezzar was a roller coaster. So he embraced sin, which caused more sin. And sin is the rejection of God. Notice what he says in verse 15. This is scary, what he says in verse 15. Last week we saw that he acknowledged God as supreme over every other God, but there's one other God that he didn't think of last week, and it was himself. Because look at verse 15, it says, Who is the God who will deliver you? He looks at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He knows they serve supreme God, the one he acknowledged as bigger than all of the other gods. And now Nebuchadnezzar, in his pride, his sin is leading into more sin, and it's the rejection of God. He says, who's going to save you? In one moment, he discredited Almighty God in his own life. Among all the other gods he's considering, he's saying, None have the ability to rescue you three from my furnace, my punishment. Doesn't that sound like what Satan tries to tell us? None of you can rescue, nobody can rescue you from me. Don't look at Jesus. Don't look at that guy over there. He, you know, he wasn't so perfect. He lived a good life, but he can't be your savior. I'm the most powerful. Isn't that what Satan tries to tell us? And the king is saying the exact same thing. In one moment, he says, God has no power. I am the one with all of the power. How quickly sin breeds sin, produces more sin, and we become more and more comfortable with that sin in our lives. See, the truth of the matter is you can't sin and accept God's direction at the same time. You can't sit here right now with a sinful thought while you worship God. They can't coexist. Nebuchadnezzar, we see this back and forth roller coaster, but I think it's real relatable to our everyday life because we suffer from the same idea. I can pick the moments where I want to honor God, but I want to still honor myself because at the end of the day, it's all about me. And that's a very scary Thing, but we see it in Nebuchadnezzar. But now we get to the point where we all like to feel motivated, right? Which is a great story of faith because in verses 16 through 18, we see the faithful, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refuse and they remain true to what they're called to do. We see three things from them. We see rejection while being respectful. This is huge. This is real big. Notice what they say to the king. You know, earlier, the other people came to the king and said, oh, king, live forever. And they toyed with him. And they basically worshipped him in their greeting. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say something similar with a respectful greeting. They say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, king. They don't say live forever. They're not worshipping him, but they still maintain their respect for him. They never cross the line to worship, but they respect. How often do we throw out all respect 
when we disagree with someone. Think politically, okay? How often do you just disrespect political leaders that you can't stand and you're disgusted with their sin and so it gives you every right to just be ruthless with your words? That's not biblical. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would go to this king who stared them in the eye and said, I will murder you if you don't worship me. And they say, oh king, we disagree. They didn't make it about him. They made it about God. We disagree with you because we want to worship our God. So they reject this whole idea of worship in a respectful way. In verses 16 and 17, we see that they take ownership of who they are without any excuse. They say, we have no need to answer you, king, in this matter, because our God, whom we serve, is able to take care of us. 